needs beyond um, what is essential. And desire seems to be somewhere between these things. It's somewhere between um, the physical and the cognitive, and somewhere between pleasure and suffering. It's somewhere in which we are not at the orgasm, we're not at the pleasure. We are somewhere before that, but we are also not at the suffering. We're at some place where it is um, balancing between these things, and we're able to um, contemplate. Um, Disinterested contemplation is a concept of Kant. Does anyone know about that? So yeah, dis the problem okay. with Kantian disinterest. Okay, um, yes. So I was thinking about this this morning, uh, and in his uh, analytic of the sublime, it, what it, Adorno touches on in the beginning of the Adorno reading that we had, mm -hmm. um, is rightfully positioning Kant as saying that the aesthetic experience is uh, qualified and exists within a, a realm of disinterest. And I feel like this is only really, my problem is, I think it relates to maybe a lot of other things we've been talking about in this class, but just to begin, like, um, Kant, his entire framing of the relation to a work of art or to the aesthetic experience seems to be placed on the side of the spectator, and in my mind this is the only way that you could arrive at disinterest as a state. I, I think it's completely absurd to think about the aesthetic experience from the point of a maker or someone who creates and, and believe that disinterest would enter into that experience at all. Okay. Um, so, I think... Producer and yeah. consumer, I think, would be... Producer and consumer, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one who makes and one who spectates on making. I mean, and that doesn't really go to the point of answering what the, like how through the categorical intuition we know disinterest or can know the categories by which we assess the aesthetic experience, but mm -hmm. that's just my response to it. No, that's <laughs> great, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, and it was in the reading, and we'll talk about it more with Adorno, but this idea of disinterested contemplation has a bit to do with sort of this contemporary experience we have, almost like Benjamin and the arcades, where we sort of like passively, visually consume, and in the manner by which we do it, it's a very, for lack of better words, disinterested contemplation, as Kant had talked about with the aesthetic, because we're not necessarily motivated. As you flip through a magazine or you visit a website, it's not like you're obsessed to see an image and then go consume the product, maybe that's being advertised. It's more of a removed sensibility, and in this way, desire seems aligned with on we, right, which is a sense of almost disenchanted. We, especially almost everyone here, has a sense of sometimes we're jaded, we've seen too much, we've seen too many ads, we've seen too many images, and that saturation point um, seems to be a half relationship with desire, even though, um, as the introduction to the book um, discusses, there's a tight relationship going on between desire and will, um, and whether or not desire is a motivator of will, this is a big question in philosophy, whether desire is an inhibitor of will, um, that relationship between the two. Um, can you go to that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, introduction for our text for this course. Um, and again, I mentioned today, there's a lot of secondary material, but I do think that it gives a um, great overview of how desire has had a role in philosophy, and the introduction is essential, please read it if you have not, um, because it summarizes the two forces, at least in contemporary thought from the 20th century, um, which have been what? The two images represented. The two ways that people have mainly talked about desire have been that desire is will to and will to what? Will to... Sex and power. Sex and power, right? We either are having desire that builds up towards a sexual achievement, an orgasm, a fulfillment, or we're having a desire to control and to influence and to have status or significance. Um, and these um, sort of dialogues of desire are also prominent in commercial um, photography, not just fashion, but in, of course, any capitalist commercial photography. There's a lot of sexual imagery and a lot of power imagery. And those um, are really important in terms of what the thinkers um, in this book are uh, presenting. Okay, so thoughts on the introduction and the summary of desire and philosophy. Okay. 
goes back to Plato and Aristotle, mm -hmm. um, and then forward to you know the post-Kantian and Gerica, um, where desire is, is desire encompasses everything and has less to do with um, um, surrender of bodily interests and that sort of thing. That's a big point. Yes. So it's really just tracing the history of desire, and with more emphasis on the um, contemporary or at least the 20th century. Okay. Okay, other thoughts? There's a lot in here, actually, in the introduction, so. I was a bit, I, I wasn't expecting the power piece to be in there. It made me mm -hmm. think about, uh, uh, there's a documentary, Century of the Self, which is about sort of um, the use of advertising and political advertising. And okay. And move towards uh, kind of third way. Uh, politics over, but uh, it, it uh, covers off uh, Edward Bernays, who's a nephew of Freud, and, and it makes the linkage between sort of <coughs> advertising and political power. You know, okay. I wasn't expecting to see But that. through Freud, yeah. which is interesting because that's the introduction categorizes this as kind of a division between a Freudian and a Hegelian approach of Hegel on the side of power, so that's a nice little... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as the most influential. Because like everyone's had something to say about desire, but Freud and Hegel um, have been the most influential in terms of our contemporary thought, according to this author. Yes. Okay. Um, can you go to the next one? Oh, oh, this is just an editorial, <coughs> which I thought was kind of, kind of neat. So Greg Cadell is pretty, he's a well-known photographer also. And I just, I happened to come across this when I was reading this and I was like, it's actually called Sex Power. Because one thing that the um, author doesn't address exactly is there's also this idea that sex is about power. I mean, he's really separating them for clarity purposes, but, you know, a, there are a lot of people that think sex is a power. <coughs> and the roles of, of gender um, in society and the power that they have and sort of the reign of the man and the reign of the female. And, and the use of the body for varying degrees of power, and of course the masochism and all of these things, and how um, you know sex is a realm of power, and uh, it's almost unfair to say that it's something that's very separate um, in terms of thinkers. Okay, can you just? I have the images. I actually think this is not the most interesting um, editorial, but I liked the title of it. Okay, you can keep going. All right, and then this just highlights the key points um, in terms of the thinkers, obviously. Um, you know, everyone can't talk about Plato without talking about plurality and his concepts of love are aligned with his concept of, uh, concepts of desire. Um, and then Aristotle, this idea of um, that desire is subject to will, which is the thought we were thinking of, um, Machiavelli, that desire will take the form of will. Um, and then Kant, this idea that desire has limits, that it's not necessarily infinite um, with our will. Thoughts on, on the relationship between desire and will? Yes? Uh, would you or anyone be able to just briefly elaborate on Machiavelli's uh, notions of desire and will? Um, okay, well let's look at what the author says. I mean, I can't, um, personally, I wouldn't say that I have um, a personal take on desire taking the form of will, but I mean, somebody who's writing about power, in the case of Machiavelli, um, would see desire as having a certain agency, obviously, um, but um, I can't cite particular things by him, but I would say in general, you're talking about someone who is focused on this sort of hunger for power, this hunger for influence, um, which would typically be associated with the idea that desire would have to have some relationship to will. I would say without a doubt. Um, whereas Aristotle, who's somebody driven by reason, would say, of course, that will has some sort of, you know, um, authority or higher power than desire, which would be primal for Aristotle. Um, so, I don't know. But, um, have other opinions on this? Yes. I think with, with Machiavelli, um, in, in writing about desire and power, it takes a much more kind of instrumentalized view. Like, if you and he's talking about the, the prince and the, the people, and he's, uh, I think he makes an argument around if, if you know what the people desire, and then you can incentivize what you want them to do. So mm -hmm. it's actually a form of kind of social control mm -hmm. put into place. Uh, yeah. And I think that makes yeah. him a lot different than the way that the others are talking about desire. Mm, more manipulative. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 
Machiavelli came across to me as more deterministic. So, yeah. Um, thinking of agency, it's, <coughs> it's interesting for me. Well, I, but yes. Machiavelli thinks that the prince can have the agency. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which is which he's not. So he's not completely eliminating agency. Just it can be used to. He's looking at it from yeah. a perspective yeah. of the prince. Yeah. But yeah. the prince then. Right at that point of view. Yeah. Which is why Schiller comes after Kant and critiques that with the aesthetic education mm -hmm. and puts the will then outside of yourself into natural law. Where taking basically taking the will where Machiavelli must be has the will and the prince, mm -hmm. puts it back outside and between <coughs> nature and population um, yes. in art. Yes. Where art becomes how you educate. The masses. Exactly. And I think, um, I think it's Olivia Zan that talks about this exact point in one of our meetings, I'm pretty sure, but about the education of art um, sort of shifting. But I mean, I think this also gets back to the disinterest of the con, this idea that, um, and, and this has to do too with the age of um, information that we're in right now and the detachment we have with our devices, that we've sort of begun to think because we interact with a machine that we have a reason above desire, we have sort of like we're on the side of thinking and intellect with the computer, we're not in this sort of primal zone, we're like detached from um, our animal nature because we're, we're typing, you know, but the reality is, is there is some dialogue going on, but we've shifted really since the Enlightenment to an area in which man of reason may reason above sort of this really innate quality. Um, but there are, of course, a lot of thinking, think thoughts that go against, I guess. Well, I was just going to say, it seems to me, though, that to some extent with, like, all the discussions around sort of, like, gaming addiction and addiction to technology, mm -hmm. there were almost sort of, like, the pendulum swinging back the other way, that even mm -hmm. though it's not mm -hmm. animal, it's, it's sort of, we're, so I think we're, we're realizing more and more that we're, we're not in control of ourselves mm -hmm. through, yes. through these technologies and stuff. And, and I think there's sort of a blossoming of a, of a discourse of, of sort of distributed self and, and not inability to, to kind of control oneself, even if it's not um, animal per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent point, yes. I think, Cho I think Schopenhauer sort of touches on a very similar topic because he puts will as sort of a primal force in the whole entire world, saying that we are basically controlled by will and are directed that way. So even our desires would be mm -hmm. sort of developed through this will to act and even video gaming and all that would become through our own, would be will acting for us in some mm -hmm. those moments. I think, I don't know if we want to, yeah. like, to jump. Of course. Just, just, just the whole discussion around the Bard text that you just, that we got. The, the, the Derrida Bar. text. We're going to talk about it. Oh, yes. that for tomorrow, the Bard? The Derrida is for the Adorno. The, the Roland Bard text. I mean. The Roland Bard about love? Um, I just had this day was waiting on it. Lover's Discourses in two days, yes. I'll we'll talk about it in two <laughs> <laughs> You're in the future. You're living in the future. Yeah. Okay, can you go to the next? Um, Don't love to okay. But if you want to mention it, if it's relevant. Well, you just because it. the translation um, of Schoenbeck's concepts is wrong. Well, oh, not wrong, well, but... Well, it's, um, yeah. it's off. It's, 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 well, it's actually interesting to put, because a lot of times it's translated as waiting, uh -huh. and it's typically translated as expectation. Uh -huh. um, so if you put expectation and waiting together, this like condition of desire that mm -hmm. you're talking about yes. is suspended. Yes, the suspense, anticipation. So he mm -hmm. jumps back, so he, this whole, when we're talking about this interest in art, mm -hmm. it, sound, it seems like he's jumping back to come. You know what I mean? Like he's going back this disinterest, um, but it, it's weird when you put the term uh, expectation mm. instead of waiting. It becomes moral in the sense that we expect to be bored. <laughs> you know well, that's I mean? jaded, right? So on some right, level, which is, which is yeah. kind of how I feel this text is made. Expect to be bored. Yeah, I think that um, well, the saturation. I mean, it's the fear of getting bored that it's. The undifferentiated spectacle, excuse me, um, is where we have reached our comfort level. The stream of unconsciousness. <coughs> so, like when you live in a stream of unconsciousness, all of the time that you cannot get away from, um, and that is image-based, um, then there is a. Um, I don't want to say lack because there is not a lack, but there is perhaps no lack of images, right? But there is a. Um, Maybe on behalf of the the view the viewer, um, I don't know if I want to call it expectation to be bored, but there is a, you know, there is no one looking not to be bored. 
which it gets back to pattern recognition as we were talking about earlier. It's not the pattern, but it's the exception that should be observed. So that's this is all sort of related. So I think yeah. it's a relevant point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it also what you just said about being uh, immersed in maybe like a life of images, whether or not that's all that life is, then it becomes an argument. Yes. That's where the debate. Yes. Yeah. This is all. If this is all appearance. What right. constitutes an image? Right. Yeah. Has there been Rachel any? I mean. It, we talk about these photographers as being radical, you know, sort of in decade after decade, and they're mm. so cutting edge, and they're so radical, and they end up really looking a lot alike. I mean, what what seemed radical or beautiful to me was, you know, like the big sleeve and mm -hmm. sort of, I mean, the head was still cut off, but, yeah. you know, but, the, but that was a change of perspective. Mm -hmm. What's happening now is, just, is the ratcheting up of the violence and the, um, and these editorials mm -hmm. that are about you know insanity and and um, extremes extremes that are so extreme that you can't be more you know mm -hmm. and and now we're showing models that are like have black eyes and they're you know mm -hmm. like dead and um, so how much farther can we go beyond that and mm -hmm. it, has anybody successfully been radical in not being extreme, but just yeah. being, I mean, in recent years. Yes. Well, there are, I mean, okay, so the Naomi Klein shock doctrine, I'm sure you all know, mm -hmm. in the sense that that's what we are now seeing all the time, is this sort of radical, 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 yeah. like, it's, like, it's not who needs radical anymore. Um, and I think that um, Jürgen Teller, Walter Pfeiffer, our guest, um, there are a certain number of, um, do not want to use the word, but I will use it, authentic, <laughs> People yeah. who um, aren't interested in anything but sort of an intimacy with the subject mm -hmm. and are motivated with a naturalism that um, should aesthetically look different mm -hmm. when we receive the images. Okay. But I don't know, I mean, I think that, that some of these photos, in my perspective of what I've seen, are capable of breaking that code system, but um, without maybe looking aesthetically, but they're doing something subtle. And even if it's a dialogue from photographer to photographer or from viewer to viewer that has a certain consciousness, like Mizell, as I mentioned, is not someone who everybody gets. Some people just look at it and go, crazy fashion. I mean, you know, sort of the, like, again, with the stream of unconsciousness, people think of extremes as just being accepted. You know, like there's Project One Runway on TV. There's, you know, everything is kind of, that's the nature of the spectacle. What appears is good. Um, so that's the nature of the spectacle. So, I mean, I think we accept it as something radical, um, but that people have to continue to work within it to reinvent and try other ways. And there are ones that do it in a natural way, if you can call it natural or authentic. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not even sure at this point what that, what that means, but yeah, but just sort of something notable, something mm. as you're yeah. describing maybe with multiple. Yeah. I mean, it's really, I look at a lot of images all the time to the point where I get so exhausted with images, I can't really look at them anymore, I mean, I just, mm -hmm. like, it's so many, and it's very hard for me, like, I will look through a lot of images, one after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other, and I will hit something that is, like, different, mm -hmm. you know, and then so, same, 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 different, and, you know, also, I'll look at fashion editorials, ugh, there's so much on the internet that is ridiculous, that I'm just, like, oh, like, this one, if we can go back, actually, go back to this one, I, I mean, I think it's horrible, frankly. It's really not doing anything. It's really in the currency of the uh, sort of stream of images, the spectacle. This it's very fire. formulaic, yeah. right? It's there's nothing here. I almost didn't want to use it for that purpose mm -hmm. because there's nothing here that does anything really that we haven't already seen or that would cause us or prompt us to think about anything beyond. Oh, it's just a bunch of fashion images, you know. And so I try not to call out things like that unless, the, in this case, the title was relevant to our discussion because there was that synthesis between sex and power. Mm -hmm. But other than that, the photographs aren't, to me, of great note. Yeah. So, um, okay, but um, just to get back to Derrida and desire, um, I want to shift gears. If you just go to the hands, it's fine. Um, this is actually an art photographer here. I just think it's an interesting job. Um, so let's talk, before we go into the chapter on Derrida, I, I wanted to talk about some primary writing of his, which is this piece that I gave you, which is two short paragraphs. Um, and then I guess first we'll just talk about it as it's written and what he's saying. Has anyone had the opportunity to read Dis Dissemination, the whole text? Any of you, by any chance? Okay, so I, I would suggest to you 
that even if you read a chapter of this book, it is probably the most influential um, book early on in, in Derrida's writing. It is the one where he is sort of almost exposed. It's like naked Derrida because I often found that I would read Derrida and, and the structure of the writing um, was such a decoration that it was hard for me to see the core. Where here he's very explanatory, um, and I think that it's helpful, a very helpful text for really having Derrida almost tell his own story in a way, which is very rare. Um, so, um, what's happening in this text that I give you for today? What does he say? He seems said all the must be said already. I'm bored. Okay. There's nothing left to say that has not been said. Okay. What we meant to say. Good. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Pointing out that we what we meant to say. Okay. But then he says well, the reader must bear with us if we, we continue on past having said everything that we meant to say. Okay. So he's acknowledging the reader at the very beginning. This is the first page of the first chapter, and he's saying, you know, everything that we meant to say has been said. Bear with us. All right. Um, there's, a, there's a lot more there. I mean, there's a lot in these two paragraphs. To a considerable degree, so implying that everything has not been said. Okay. Then there may be possibly out of the bounds of what's considerable. Okay. Meaning possibly beyond his own reason as he's writing it. Okay. What else? When he says, with the exception of, and then he lists a bunch of stuff, supplement, texture, tissue, would be three things to pop out in my mind. Just by looking at, like, thinking about the photographs you've been looking at. Okay, and what do you mean? With, with the exception of this or that supplement. But I just think of it like um, grammar, like the predicate. Okay. So, like you said, he's maybe not aware of it. <coughs> when he's writing, the subject is writing, stuff happens, comes out, which yes. is kind of like the grammatical predicate. What he mean. didn't mean or intend, perhaps. Yeah, well, the, yeah, okay. well, the language takes over, let's say. The language is taking over. The material over. takes over. The material takes over, okay. Yeah, well, he says the, the, the texture of the text is he said all, he said everything, um, but, and so the texture, you know, the content is, he's remarked on, he said the content and remarked on the content, and now he's going to talk about the, the sort of uh, texture and style and the way that it's framed. Mm -hmm. it's that this can only take place within the tripartite, the textual, the textile, and the histological. Mm -hmm. This is the domain of that articulation. Mm -hmm. Which is a question of what constitutes a metaphor and metaphoricity. Um, which is what I think related to a question that came up earlier in class in the first uh, section, which was the question of what is a what is of representation, a question of what does an army fatigue symbolize or represent, mm -hmm. which doesn't at all really touch upon what we has to be taken into account within these two paragraphs, which is that we haven't yet determined what dissemblances or what a metaphor is and how metaphor functions uh, if this is the, the only domain, if this is the tissue that we're working within. Okay. But how does he release us from, what is the emphasis that the end of the second, or the part of the second paragraph is kind of releasing us from this striving to define, he says, but what we're doing engages in what? Well, like the force of play and a kind of continuation. Um, an openness to play. An openness to play, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I think helps the metaphor and helps the sense of mystery, meaning, which is always sort of sustained with what he's writing to some extent. Sure. Um, and he calls it, of course, a game is what he's calling language ultimately and writing. Um, so my question and why we're reading this um, for this class is, 
twofold. One would be um, the economy or the language of images. <laughs> would you say the same, God bless you, that we have already seen everything we've meant, been meant to see, um, and it's just a recontextualization over and over and over. And then secondly, is our images, and specifically the ones we're viewing in this class, also a game that's being played? As to the first question, whether or not they've seen all that there is to be seen. Mm -hmm. All that there is meant to be seen. That is meant to be seen, mm -hmm. I don't know, but uh, I don't think that how we see things, we haven't experienced all the ways in which um, we perceive those things. Okay, so maybe it's, um, like Sophia was talking about framing, right? So maybe it's um, the framing of what we see, as in the writing, and the context contextualization, okay? And I think, and maybe this is just a small point, but I think there's a difference between what we've meant to see versus what has been meant to be shown. Okay, good. Because, I mean, it seems like in this case, to, you know, draw an analogy with this, there's a difference between what we meant to say versus what we're meant to hear. But those two things are, are rather different, I think. It gets back to, I think it was Terry was talking about when we were thinking about sociology as what we viewing versus people wearing and what they're expressing again. So which lens are we looking through with the camera or are we looking outward in the sense of expressing ourselves for others to see what we present? So that's always good um, as well to think about, okay? Well, um, yes. um, last night at Leslie's presentation, she talked mm -hmm. about looking and seeing mm -hmm. and the difference. They, you know, saying that her class is exploring the difference between those two things. And I think in her filmmaking, um, that's what she does incredibly well is see and, mm -hmm. and then frame so that we see. So she frames and presents moments that we would, mm -hmm. that we think are noise, and because of, of the beginning that she chooses or how long she chooses to hang on to a shot, it changes, it changes my looking to seeing, or it changes, mm -hmm. it changes how I see. Mm -hmm. So, I could have seen that image, um, but if if it hadn't been the length that it was, or if it hadn't been framed the way it was, yeah, I would have seen something else, and you would have said, mm -hmm. oh, we all saw the same thing, mm -hmm. but um, the frame is different. Or the, mm -hmm. the well, the manner, the manner by which the receiver is perceiving? But it had to be the, the, cre you know, the creator of the image mm. The intention of the, the intention. Okay. The intention is huge, and especially mm -hmm. with Leslie, that's. Cool. Well, I would say a lot of whether it's again with the whole culture jamming and the idea of people who are creating images to disrupt the spectacle, right? So there's a sense of certain image makers who, like Chris Marker, would be another, who are creating content that disrupts the way in which we look. Um, and then I'm just thinking in French, you know, it's regarde, like when you want someone's attention, like regard. And I use this in English all the time, hey, regard, listen to me. Because you want someone to give you a look and a consideration, um, which is a different way. We don't really have a way of saying that without putting these, look at me and listen to me, you know, is um, regarde, you know, regard me. And um, we don't have a way of saying that. And I think that um, this goes back to the, also the disinterested contemplation is that we tune out into this sort of receptor of the unconscious stream and we don't regard, we don't stop, we don't um, have something that maybe disrupts that, especially um, in the case of commercial photography, I would say, most often. I would suggest that yeah. in English, attention is actually the word that it's characterizes It's a good one, yeah. That, because attention is, um, is multivalent sensorial mm -hmm. and it doesn't... Optum. yeah. Yeah, it doesn't... Uh, but in the sense of, of it, but it also in English it diverges from like the, the demand and mm -hmm. the, the kind of authoritative attention mm -hmm. can also be regarded I think on a, mm -hmm. a much broader spectrum mm -hmm. um, you know a kind of gradation in terms of mm -hmm. 
But if you say both terms are in between, let's say paying attention and, and looking at something, but that the French goes more to the looking side, where the attention goes more to the paying attention side. To listening, almost maybe. Yeah. To listening. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I think what you're saying is like if you can, if you're on your iPad or iPhone or you know whatever you're doing, and someone says, "Hey, um, blah blah blah," and they just start talking to you, or they say, "Look at me," or something, versus they say, "Hey, attention." It's almost like a command, you know, or it calls you away from distraction. It brings you back into a sense of like wake up, like. In right. The so, yeah, and I guess actually that that just as a as a concept and as an operative, uh -huh. um, like less than in a verbal a verbal kind of situ uh, situation that attention is something that you one can also think about as functioning within the observer and it's a, it's a dis disposition and it's a it's a state like one can mm -hmm. I, I imagine could be in a state of regard mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. more or less extent all the time mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. uh, and I think it, yeah okay um, Simone, Simone Weil talks about mm -hmm. attention as a form of generosity. So it's something mm -hmm. that isn't being it isn't mm -hmm. uh, being articulated from as a demand. It's something that's given, mm -hmm. and that this is what how attention is like should be considered in its uh, kind of mm -hmm. a deeper re sense. A regard is given, I think, also. You given, yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay. So language of images. Have we said it all? And we said maybe it's the contextualization. Um, do we play a game with images in the same manner that we're playing games with language? Yes. Yes? Okay. How? I, I think uh, just to step back for a moment, that sure. if we're you know, talking about fashion photography then as a medium with the history, mm -hmm. um, you know, to look at the, the limitations of its framing as well. One is that it seems to be very much you know, situated in a print context, mm -hmm. in a magazine uh, context, and is uh, uh, developed or perpetuated by uh, commercials and businesses of a certain scale mm -hmm. that can, you know, if they're either advertising themselves or with the magazine presenting certain types of editorials that will be producing a certain uh, scale of, of activity. And so to me the question comes into, well, what does that leave out? And, and perhaps there's a certain type of fashion photography that functions exclusively in contemporary art, but I, I'm thinking more of uh, um, what of those independent designers that don't even reach that scale, mm -hmm. uh, who aren't being covered because the commercial side isn't mm -hmm. present, and mm -hmm. what do they do, and, and how do they proliferate it. And that's just one of the questions that come up, because if it is a field and a medium, then it's, it's fairly specific mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how it moves. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you asking me? Do you want me to answer it? Uh, uh, it's, it's just a, a thought. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I mentioned earlier that Olivier Zam, who's an independent magazine publisher, I mean, will read his essay. We're reading, hopefully read it for this class. Um, and he mentions that it's significant in the sense that there are, I mean, independent fashion designers, every neighborhood has one, <laughs> but um, their manner by which they um, enter commerce is going to be independent in each case, and their manner by which they promote and advertise themselves is also different. Like I mentioned earlier, I talked several times, I mentioned the Antwerp Six, who were anti-advertisements. I mean, you don't see and Mula Meister acts because she does not want to enter that dialogue. Um, however, a lot of young designers take positions, oh, I'm not going to do ads, I'm just going to get my work out there, and then they end up um, doing that. So, um, what, you know, ultimately it just depends on the scale of the business and how much you want to sell, and to that extent. I don't think that um, because it's a commercial media, that fashion photography is really regarded um, with a sort of contemplation whether interested or disinterested and um, dismissed typically as just a way to sell. Um, and then what I'm trying to emphasize are when large-scale corporations or large-scale magazines are hiring these people and these people are kind of going against um, or challenging the expectations of what a fashion app should look like, essentially. Um, but there are a few exceptions of younger designers who have done some interesting things. Very few. So, maybe that answers your question. 
Um, well, just as far as what the Antwerp Six did want, mm -hmm. it seemed like you said that they wanted to provide comfort and they wanted to provide but what thoughtful want? design. Thoughtful design. Yeah. And um, so, were their clothes particularly? I mean, were they? Cozy? Were they like, I mean, how? Well, earlier, do you remember it? the sweater I showed earlier right. with the inner tube and it, it was, was orange? Safe. And it was, yes. Uh -huh. um, some of their clothing, uh, for example, Andy Mühlmeister, does anyone know Andy Mühlmeister's clothing? No. So, Andy Mühlmeister, for example, um, I have one of her dresses, and every time I put it on, I have to, like, it takes me like five minutes to get on. Because it, and, and actually, some of her clothing comes with instructions for how to <coughs> put it on. It, it's a it's about um, and it, because we're focusing on fashion media I don't have any um, support material for this but um, you can just look her up basically a lot of the designs are calculated to like you know where you put your arms in the way you feel your body the way you feel the clothing mm -hmm. and so it's that idea of with also the Yoshi Yamamoto clip that we watched so it's a designer who is so devoted to the construction, the material, and the form, mm -hmm. that entering into this dialogue of the commerce is, the, you know, it's like walking through the gutter in the dress you just made. To them, <laughs> right? But then there are designers who take this position, for example, amongst the six Antwerp six, you have Mark Margiela, who is <coughs> sold to Diesel, and Emile Meister, who's still holding out, Dries Van Noten, who's got ads everywhere, and, you know, so some of them eventually, like, for lack of better words, grew up and needed to, like, you know, have a place to needed to earn <laughs> money, and so these designers, in their idealistic ways, and as I mentioned, Yoshi Yamamoto going bankrupt, unless they have this commercial component to their media, um, it's very different. Like for example, filmmakers are capable <coughs> of getting grants and speaking and doing these types of things. Very few fashion designers are given grants because what they make is a product, so it's not really considered to have that same authenticity. Um, and so it's a different area. If you're not selling your clothes, you're doing something else. You're not doing fashion design anymore. In fact, one of the Antwerp Six is in the slow food movement. So, I mean, you know, she left fashion design altogether because she couldn't survive. So, um, having um, visual advertisements and promoting your brand and being in editorials is a tool to survive or to succeed financially within the realm of fashion because it's creating a commercial product. But I, I think the assumption that that could not happen. Uh, do you know Susie Gablix, um, yeah, the like, reenchantment mm -hmm. of art, mm -hmm. um, and just how art was so is is such a commodity and so consumer based, um, and kind of the destructive nature of that. Um, it seems like there just is this assumption that that's the way it is. And is there any room for the reenchantment of, or the enchantment, I'm not sure it's the reenchantment of, of fashion and connecting it in some way to, to comfort or um, uh, something that's a little bit more, I don't know, just based in a different place. So, no, go ahead. I'm, I'm what occurs to me is like um, that there. I mean, there is evidence, and there is there are experiences that are a part of fashion. If there's anything that's not part of that, um, that are do take into account. There are designers who are working from. Uh, from indigenous cultures, from a post-colonial perspective, there are designers who are working from uh, a place of, you know, wanting to engage with the fashion media apparatus from the perspective of a queer identity, or think about the making process in relation to gift economies, or um, you know, it's, I, I think that I mean this is a particular model, and of course, like any discourse, there are ancillary ways and lenses to consider one's practice in relation to that discourse. Um, but it's always, in relation, it's always in relation to I just also want to mention just one thing, Mike, just really quickly, is that remember that like this class is fashion media, not fashion design. Sure. And right. so when you are talking about fashion yeah. media as a realm, this is commercial 
photography by and large. And so it does exclude, unfortunately, by the nature of the media, um, some of these things that are not necessarily within this spectrum of media. They're in the discipline of fashion, they are creating, they are designing, but they're not as visually, visually present. Um, they're not represented in the visual dialogue. If you were to look through the top or most regarded or um, maybe talented, I hate that word because it's very subjective, but the photographers that are maybe produce, producing the most interesting images, they're not necessarily representing some of these designers that are in places or producing with a certain um, different sensibility than the ones, unfortunately, that are producing for masses. So I think that they exist, but the focus is on the media rather than, um, for, for this particular class, I would say, rather than the designers that are, because they're, I mean, as I mentioned, there's a fashion designer in every town. I mean, there's a fashion blogger in every town. There's, there are people who are sort of digging into this topic of fashion and um, doing it, as Yamamoto mentioned, in a way that's almost about being eternal and connecting to something that isn't necessarily of our moment. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think photography is what I think is more of what we're trying to focus, what the course is trying to focus on. But, but it's a valid, a valid question to ask about fashion, of course, is how to sort of make it a difference with that. And I think the only ones that I can think of that have taken a position against photos would be the anthropsex. And they even do a thing where if they show and present their work, they put masks on the models. So the idea is to sort of, to, to stop from this sort of aestheticization that we make of the whole fashion industry, which is really just so oh, models and photos and you know, yeah. <laughs> but that seems a little like it, well. yeah. It can be okay. Well, yeah. to be to be thought about. Okay, yeah. Mike, you had a sorry to yeah, delay. Yeah, okay. um, um, just as a sort of parallel sort of thing to that, um, there was a, when was I think it was like the mid eighties. Benetton had a really famous mm -hmm. ad campaign where they had um, a shot of a, a, a dying AIDS victim. Yes. And it said, "You know, the colours of Benetton." Yes, mm -hmm. it's called. So they have a, a partnership in their in their company called Colors of Benetton, and since like the '90s, they've been doing an ad a campaign each year that benefits a different um, yeah. sort of nonprofit. It, and AIDS has been one of them. Yeah, but then some of those um, just they, they sort of reach the limit of taste for the the consumer or the manufacturer or something. There was a mm -hmm. yeah, there was a. A sort of limit to the social penetration that they could do with fashion. You know, fashion's this thing, but mm -hmm. how do you even get your hands kind of thing? You know? Yeah, I mean, they, they still do it every year. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's their foundation, it's called Colors of Medicine. Um, they, um, you know, they've had shots of like a, an oil drenched duck, for example, to go against. They don't just go against fashion, they go, uh, they're global issues. So they had um, portraits of um, small business owners in Africa one year. They had. Um, what else have they done? They had um, a, a friends campaign where they had a Palestinian and an Israeli embracing each other. They've done a lot of different issues. And um, but if your general question is taste level in fashion, I mean that's an interesting one because there's definitely a standard of taste. And um, I don't know of them being rejected. I never heard anything about them being rejected from running in a particular magazine. I never read anything about that, but. That would be interesting. I mean, you know, Kenneth Cole's another one who always puts a little byline in his ad. It's like a shoe, and then it'll say, like, women deserve the right to choose any shoe and any, you know, ethical right, want the thing they want. Or, you know, he puts always a political line in his, um, his ads. And this gets back to this idea of fashion just is the big monster that swallows everything, because it's sort of like, okay, fine, you can have your little political idea, and you can put your little ad in my big fat fashion magazine that puts all this other commercial stuff in there where it's just going to be part of the unconscious stream of images. So I don't know. It's sort of back to this question of what can be radical because, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't. Would, would that photo that um, of Linda Bengliss? Pardon? The, uh, Linda, Linda Bengliss, she was, um, um, uh, I think it was in an art forum magazine. She was depicted with a huge strap-on dildo. <laughs> And uh, big sunglasses, and so really, it's quite a famous photo. Yeah, like I, some... if I saw it, I may, I don't know it off the top of my head. Okay, yeah. Okay. But I don't know if I. But, but, but it was the art and power thing. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and I was just going to add or ask, like, if I don't know if I understand correctly, yeah. but it's maybe what you're getting at is it's not it's necessarily a matter of taste, but like ethics in terms of yeah, I guess, mm. um, exploiting. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah and um, yeah, and the the fact that of course people you know are that these things haven't been rejected because these are issues where money is mm. or capital is mm. needed. Exactly. So yeah. there's, there's um, I'm trying to think of where there's a dependence. Um, we're going to mm -hmm. save all the money we can get even if we have to work with the assholes. Yeah, to a certain extent. And then you'll, but you'll see really bad fashion sometimes right in the middle. Like it's like JC is trying to reinvent themselves and they're like in the middle of Vogue where like that's like the time, the not expensive kind of ad input like in a place where I think no one will get to it. It's the yeah. ends and the fronts that are yeah. most valuable and usually are Louis Vuitton which owns pretty much every luxury brand from Dior, etc. all the big brands, um, even Marc Jacobs. So. Um, those are usually Louis Vuitton ads on the end. Um, okay, so I want to just move to Dairy Dot. Yes. Oh, I just wanted to forward. mention something. We, we've been talking about a lot of um, high-end uh, mm -hmm. fashion photography. Yes. And in, re in regards to the spectacle and the ability of that to then revolutionize itself. Mm -hmm. But then there's also a lot of fashion photography that exists in other mediums besides these major magazines mm -hmm. that deal with fashion yes. that aren't necessarily at this high level of class or, mm -hmm. you know, high level of... Uh, Status. It's status yeah. income. So I wonder perhaps there's this idea that there's a dis because there's a disconnect, there's no, I no ability for it to revolutionize itself. Um, so it's a so there it's are so different. many fashion magazines. I actually didn't present it because we don't have time, but I do encourage everyone to look at those links on the blog, the history of photo and the history of magazines. If you click on the history of magazines, it's interesting because um, there were three years ago there was a show at V, um, maybe you know V Gallery or V Magazine in New York. If you don't, you should check it out. They had a show there called Magazines, where they traced um, the magazine and included like you know, be like you think of Thrasher as like like a skateboard or whatever, but like really esoteric skateboarding magazines, and then really esoteric fashion, and then really esoteric whatever. And they brought all of these very rare periodicals together and um, highlighted these outsider images. Um, and, and they produced a magazine, which was called V Magazine themselves. And they included themselves, of course, in the show. And then they included some, some rare vogues and some this or that. And it was just a chance to look at the, the dialogue. And when you look at the dialogue, it's a concophony of images. I mean, there's a lot there. Um, for the scope of this class, um, we're focusing on really what are the commercial, again, the commercial media images. Um, and there are a few outsider when we get when Walter comes, for example, on Wednesday, because he began as taking snapshots of his friends, like never with the intention to be shooting for Vogue. Um, we're going to look at some examples of that and some periodicals. I mean, you have like tiny little gay magazines being circulated with really fascinating photos. You have Interview Magazine when Andy Warhol started it, which was not like. Vogue at all, you know. Now you look at interview and it's like it looks like Vogue, but you have do you have a presence of that? Um, but is it possible now for these magazines to compete? I don't know. I mean, I just feel like maybe you know the magazine Another Magazine. This is part of it's, it's in the fashion magazine, and they're kind of funny because I mean they're called Another Magazine, and they actually hire these like big fashion photographers who work for places like Vogue, and they like have them do whatever they want and kind of unusual stuff. And the fashion industry loves it because it's like, oh, what is like instead of making a commercial thing, what is this person doing? And so, I mean, it's possible, but um, it's just like saying, you know, oh, can another website work? Can another blog work? Can I mean, you know, I used to ask the question before I created or participated in media, does the world need this? And now I sort of ask, like, how can the world need this? How can this um, influence and change, you know, in sort of the scope? Because need, I don't know, we're at this augmented needs level where we have saturation in almost everything, um, and especially photographs. So, you know, and it's like whether or not these people are going to be seen. I mean, you take somebody like Dash Snow, maybe, you know, Polaroid art photographer in New York, taking Polaroids of his friend, again, similar to Walter Pfeiffer. Images weren't really seen until, you know, he starts hanging out with the gallery assistant for Deitch Projects, and she's like, oh, Jeffrey Deitch, this gallerist, she's like, he's like, look at this, these photos, and all of a sudden, all, you know, Dash Snow starts being shown, and all of a sudden, I mean, it's just like art. Like, how does art become influential? How does it get the spotlight? You know, and he also did some fashion photographs as well. So, I mean, these things are possible, yes, but it's just like anything in life. Um, so, but f again, for the sake of this course and for a free day's time and really to sort of help us understand, um, you know, what are we trying to decipher? 
by studying media, you know, everyone from Zizek to Jacob is participating in a saturation of images and um, the field of fashion photography is this sort of area that we're all seeing all the time that we're not dissecting. And that's what I'm trying to have our focus be on. Um, but let's turn to Derrida, which is page 159 of your book. Uh, if you go to the next screen. Thank you. Oh, next one. Okay. So, um, sovereignty dissolves the values of me, truth, and a grasp of the thing in itself. Just a basic uh, thought that is quite a um, concise and good one for Derrida's position on most of writing. So what can we glean from this interpretation of Derrida? I think it's what we're talking about. It's okay. what, what in the end is driving all of these images are um, is, is really not so much the art, it's the commerce. Okay. And if it's the co commerce that we're all like, yeah, 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 we all agree, okay, we know, we know, that's what it is, then that dissolves the, the value really of pursuing the cracks that might appear where we can look for either, with, look for the meaning or the, or the redemption and a grasp of the things that, when I think of the thing in itself, um, that's like Schopenhauer, isn't it? Like the, the thing in, of itself, um, the transcendent thing. So why, why even bother, right? Okay, I, I agree if with it's everything until the why bother, because <laughs> I would No, no, but that's what I think he's saying. So, so it, because of the sovereignty, it develop, dissolves the meaning. Well, I mean, he's interested, you know, he says um, the answer is not silence, but a relation to the loss of meaning, right? So the relation to the loss of meaning is sort of where our place of engagement is, um, so I would say. And so instead of, um, which again yeah. would be relevant to commercial fashion photography, because it's not that we, oh, we have to stop making fashion images, or oh, we have to make fashion images that aren't in the spectacle, but rather, perhaps it's about within the structure or the game of the language of images to then expose how we're losing meaning, expose the loss of meaning within the language or within the game of images. Oh, I agree with that part, yeah. Here, Monsieur makes that yeah. point a lot. Unfortunately, we won't be able to have him this year, but just a, that it's like, it's a cliche at this point to talk about saturation of images. Mm -hmm. We go, oh mm -hmm. my God, what do we do? There's so many, it's really mm -hmm. dissolving us. And that this is like, that doesn't take into that doesn't isn't at all the operative question. The question is regarding the type of images, which is what I hear you saying. Yes. That it's the type of images that one makes, which is a, a question. That's like a real <coughs> yes. Um, but I do think I mean I think it's relevant to acknowledge the saturation though, because it's sort of and not in a way that's sort of a panic and how do we deal with it because it's understood, but it would be sort of as if you were drowning. And you weren't really mentioning that you were drowning, you know, to some extent. You, you have to be aware because I think we are drowning in images still. And even though we're aware of it and we dismiss it um, and we just analyze and focus on strategies for that, just like you would try to solve how you're drowning, you know, you have to figure it out. I think that that has to be part of the consciousness, the saturation. But, I mean, would you think that prior to that if you can d distinguish a kind of mm -hmm. point in history or a temporal place where this drowning begins, would you think that prior to that, the vicissitudes of life are not drowning? And, and I feel like every generation that, feels like there, yeah. there's too much. Like when newspapers started, people, yes. people thought, this is, this is crazy, there's too much information, we'll never be able to handle this. And the same yeah. with the printing press, and you know, and I think, I feel like, you know, it's, it's maybe not such a historical thing, just that, that every generation always feels like there's... Uh, but I also yeah. think it's contextual in the sense that, I mean, I don't know, I'm sure everyone has a place somewhere that you can go and you don't use your computer and you have a few days where you're away and, you know, all these moments that are disconnected. And, I, and so I think that, I don't know, I mean, I have moments where I'm not saturated. And, and I'm, so I, I do know that there is a difference. I mean, I think that um, Julian Schnabel's movie about blindness, the, the butterfly. Yes, the butterfly movie. Um, 
you know, is this idea that, and this is the great line in American Beauty, that there's too much beauty in the world. It's like, you know, there are people who, can, who are like, ah, just close my eyes, the world's too beautiful, like there's too much. I mean, you could get to the point of saying that just living is saturation, but that's not what we're talking about. I'm trying to say that there is a machine, an ideological machine, right, that is producing a set of images, which for lack of better words, I'll say propaganda, although it's not quite. Um, and that's the area that I'm concentrating on, sort of, I mean, there is that sort of human experience of saturation, but this is slightly different than the sense that we are, we are being forcefully saturated, forcefully drowned. We're not drowning because we can't swim. Someone is like holding our shoulders down, basically, in a sense. Um, yes? I think it sort of also relates to comfort level of individuals. Excellent point, yes. So, um, the... The, uh, the photographer we read about for this class, got, uh, Guy Baudin. He, yeah, Guy Baudin. Mm -hmm. He he was obviously involved with a lot of image taking, so he must have been immersed in a lot of images. But mm -hmm. one of the things he did was he pulled the telephone wire out from his wall because he hated that that immersion of communication. Yes. And so he can be immersed on one side and on another side, a different mm -hmm. aesthetic or a different involvement in information he was bothered by. Yes. So we are it, we are sort of. We are sort of drowning, but we can be drowning in sort of different ways. Yes, and people, some people are better swimmers than others. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, Mike? Yeah, bringing that on to again, too. I mean, just, yeah. <clears throat> just as text emancipation of the spectator. I mean, you know, we can, I can make a decision and not look at the magazine if I don't, if I don't want to. It's not, uh, I personally don't, I know that there's mm -hmm. images out there, but, yeah. um, and I don't need to feel protected, which I think a lot of the text, a lot of stuff yeah. is, I know it's, so cultural critique, I love that stuff, I yeah. love it myself. Yeah. But I also know that, you know, a lot of the stuff we talk about is not harmful to me. Is not harmful? Oh well, yeah. Yeah. Well I mean choices, you know. Yes, the human a human agency is so important. Yeah. Um but um one thing I, I just want to get back to with this particular Derrida text is there is one point that is being made in this text which well no one has brought up, um, but is important and it's interesting that two men said that they can disengage because what is Derrida's point and is what? Sovereignty which is aligned with Sorry? Phallocentricity and phallogocentricity. Masculinity in general, the, the power structure, this ideological machine, whatever you want to call it, the things holding our shoulders down, whatever it is, is a masculine force from Derrida's perspective. And so he's looking, um, throughout this text, this author is saying that, and pointing examples to the sex organ of language, the, the as we said, the phallus, the power, the masculinity of, and sovereignty of, of verbal textual language. So the question to ask you before we break, because we're going to break in just a minute, um, if we translate this discussion of Derrida about language, which is what I was sort of starting us with, right? So Derrida was talking about language. Is there a language of images? And we sort of say yes. Let's say to a certain extent there's some language of images. Is that dominant language of images, which we're talking about, commercial fashion photography, is that dominant language of images masculine? Well, in the first uh, impulsive Answer. Yes, absolutely. Okay, why? Absolutely. That's that's strong. Okay, why? Well, because you usually see mostly half nude females, uh, fragile, being portrayed. They usually okay. look at the camera, or not always, but often look at the camera, desiring uh, mm -hmm. the viewer. Mm -hmm. So it feels that it's directed also for the male, the, the woman is always portrayed in a position of submission, or even okay. if it's not, then it's a new fashion that women have empowerment now, and that's also new and sexy, okay. both for women and for men. Yeah, empowered women is, is even more okay. powerful for men, because it's even more sexier, to some extent. If a woman's empowered, then she feels more desired, maybe, by the man, to yeah. some extent as well. Um, what was I going to say that you said? But I'm, I'm, very, I'm, yeah, I'm very sensitive to, to uh, how to say, orthodox feminism, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in this case it's, it's so blatant, and so, mm -hmm. so absurd, it's so... Uh, so gonna, you're talking about the heterosexual male, though, yes. to be specific, okay, yes. Yeah, what I was going to add is that um, uh, I, I agree with what, what you say, but it's interesting that in that they're predominantly um, in magazines like Vogue and these mm -hmm. types of places, and I would uh, assume that the majority of the 
readers are actually female. Mm -hmm. And so this notion of um, desire, the desired uh, subject, mm -hmm. uh, is then uh, kind of the, the, the uh, end user, the, the reader, the... Yeah, but then is the male producing an image for a woman to see of how she should look so as to please? Yeah. I mean, but it's mm -hmm. also, it is for a woman, because media are teaching tools. I don't know if you guys have Eva Lamboa. He used to be here. Media are teaching tools, whether it's fine art or commercial. And the reality is, is it's in some ways teaching women how to be desirable to the male gaze. <coughs> so they are the male gaze images, and this is what a woman should look like. So we're teaching, okay, yeah. Well, I think just to add a, a layer of, of complexity, and I don't really know the answer to this, but it seems to me that your question was, is there a language of the image mm -hmm. that is, as, as there are other <coughs> language, something that's, that's fellow-centric about that language. And so I think the question is perhaps, is it, I mean, obviously there's, there's a degree to which it's, these images are patriarchal, but I think the question is, is the language itself patriarchal, or is there something patriarchal that speaks through that language. Yes, that's a very good distingu distinguishment, yes. Thank you for pointing that out. And I think that's a larger question about all media, you know, not just in this case fashion photography. And maybe perhaps fashion photography evidences or supports perhaps that this is the sort of male coming through, perhaps male power. Yeah, that's a great distinction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you have something to add? No, not really. Oh, oh. <laughs> It's um, the same. Well, actually, okay. I actually had a bad view, I suppose. It's the same kind of thing where it's, just, it's the question of like, is it the media, like the language of the medium? But it's just interesting because, like, with photography itself, obviously, that gets like a, that's a much different discussion entirely, obviously. Yeah. Like, like, can you have a, a discussion of like the essential aspects of what photography as an apparatus does? Mm -hmm. Or do you have to always have it already configured into like a conversation of the like socio political like context mm. of like what's happening. Mm -hmm. So like I just I don't even feel like I really understand the language of fashion photography mm -hmm. well enough to like be able to make a distinction to say like is mm. the language itself yeah centric because it just my gut reaction is that it has to be what's coming through. Similar gut like, reaction. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, it's a little different that if I came in and I said, okay, everyone, we're going to spend three hours this morning learning Mandarin, and then I turn around and say, okay, is Mandarin masculine, you know, as a language? And I mean, I'm not teaching you a language you don't know or have never seen, in fact. Like, and you may think that you can't understand it, but in fact, the amount of images that you yourself alone have seen that are fashion photographs, pretty high. I mean, I would say in the thousands, if not more. If you've walked, if you haven't been blindfolded, if you've walked through maybe, you know, any street, in any major city, you've seen it. If you've picked up anything ever, if you've been on the internet ever, you've seen fashion photographs. So you have a familiarity with the, the language, it's just nonverbal. And so I think this gut reaction is one that maybe you are, you do have a basis to say that, I would say. And you probably understand it better than you realize. You just, we don't analyze it, you know. It, like intuitions are deeply undervalued as yeah. Right, yeah. Just, which is weird though, because like, at what point does it come back around and like, is it empowering or is it, I mean, because there's that, there's that whole distinction of talking about like the, the weird middle ground between a, an object and flesh or whatever, mm -hmm. like, what not, and like the, the idea of being able to portray women in, in this like, this strange, like macabre, like weird way where he's actually physically hurting them. Yes. And, like, is he, do, is that the fact that they become alien and almost dolls, mm -hmm. does that make it n not weird or bad? Like, yeah. Just, uh, to me, it's not clear. <laughs> right. Well, people being injured and, and, right. and, and physically in real life <laughs> problems, consequences of photographs. It's a different, it's a different issue. Mm -hmm. But you've had, uh, did you have a question? Did you have a hand? Well, along the lines of what Justin brought up, uh -huh. if you're thinking of language as a holistic system of communication mm -hmm. and perception, mm -hmm. or are you thinking about it in terms of, you know, how the structure is arranged and rearranged and semantics, mm -hmm. that they're two different things to me, and I struggle with this question. Mm, exactly, and because it's the spectacle, it's one-way communication, so, I mean, which is changing with new media, right, the fashion blogger and speaking back or whatever, but I mean, I think that images, fashion, photography are one way, so we don't necessarily maybe have that, unless you're an artist who's reframing and cutting out the pictures and putting it back together, you're not, you're not, you're not giving back anything, so it's a language that's being served, and when a language is served, it has that kind of masculine character in a way. Um, but let's take a break. Since it's 5:35, when we come back, we will finish up with some images. I'll leave you with this commentary. This is a political satire cartoon on two of the most masculine fashion photographers. 
um, who are known for produce, producing prolific images of women in bikinis and or naked, so, in fashion magazines. 